Thank you for joining us for Transitioning Back to School, Explosive Outburst and Tourette Syndrome. We're here with Dr. Kathy Budman, who is a board-certified psychiatrist, clinical professor of psychiatry at the Hofstra Northville School of Medicine, and an internationally acclaimed specialist in Tourette Syndrome and its commonly occurring disorders. Dr. Budman is the director of the Long Island Center for Tourette and Related Disorders and a founding member of the New York State Centers of Excellence Consortium for Tourette. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Budman. My pleasure. So we're here to talk about explosive outbursts and Tourette syndrome. Would you like to start with the characteristics of what explosive outbursts are and how it relates to Tourette syndrome? Surely. I'd like to give the audience a little bit of background on this and actually how our group became interested in investigating explosive outbursts in Tourette. The truth is, 30 years ago, no one really recognized this as a common symptom. And my first patient was a 15-year-old who seemed like a very mild-mannered young man, was admitted to the hospital for observation, and during the course of his hospitalization, he was getting along well with his roommate, everything seemed to go fine until he ordered his lunch, and when his lunch was delivered, it wasn't what he had expected. Well, the next thing you know, there's a hole in the wall in the bathroom in his hospital room, and that was really very uh, striking to me. I had never seen anything like this, although his parents had described similar uh, experiences at home. Right, so, some, so that sorry was to interrupt the, you, but something as small as not getting the right lunch could set somebody off. Exactly. Right, So, okay. So at first we thought there was unusual symptoms. But the truth is, like many things, the more you ask about it, the more common you realize this symptom is. And if you don't ask it about it, there's a lot of shame associated with explosive anger and rage. Many people will not volunteer it, or they're ashamed to you know, share this information with their doctors and healthcare providers. So, now we know that it actually is one of the most common symptoms that occur in clinical populations with Tourette and is certainly the most common reason for out-of-home placement and psychiatric intervention and inpatient hospitalizations. It really causes a lot of distress, not only for the family and those around this individual, but for the person who's experiencing these symptoms. It's really, really uh, very, very painful uh, experience to go through for everyone. So are there some strategies that maybe people can um, put in place to address impulse control issues? Before I get to strategies, I think I'm gonna give you just a, a better description of what this is. So what is an explosive outburst? An explosive outburst, typically uh, the type we see in, in Tourette syndrome, are these very abrupt, very sudden explosive behaviors that usually occur in response to a trivial stress if you can even identify it. Some, some people often experience it as if it's coming out of the blue, but usually there's some precipitant. And the response is completely, <clears throat> excuse me, the response is completely out of proportion to the precipitant. So in the case that I described, not having the lunch you ordered delivered usually might, you know, someone might respond with disappointment, but they wouldn't pull a sink out of a wall. Um, if a child comes home and they were uh, frustrated because they didn't make a, a basketball team, they might be angry, but that wouldn't typically result in tearing their room apart and pulling down shelves and things like this. Uh, another example I had was an adult who uh, described his wife coming home and uh, when she couldn't find yogurt in the refrigerator, she proceeded to you know, tip the, the kitchen table over and you know start throwing things at the wall and breaking the wall. In fact we nicknamed this the sheetrock syndrome because so many families who are affected by explosive rage become very adept at sheetrocking their homes because there's so many holes in the wall. So it's abrupt, it's uh, often appears to be out of the blue or in response to a very trivial precipitant. It's usually fairly short-lived although some people will experience multiple episodes throughout the day and causes a lot of distress, obviously. And the, the response, the angry response, is grossly out of proportion to any obvious frustration or stress. 
Now, next question. What, what are the common uh, associated conditions, right? What we've learned is that ticks alone are not typically associated with explosive outburst. However, our latest research shows us that the overwhelming majority of people who suffer from Tourette syndrome will experience one or more comorbidities during the course of their lifetime. And it's these comorbidities that appear in combination with the tick disorder to sort of set up uh, the, the, uh, the, the environment for explosive outbursts to flourish. Now, what are these comorbidities? Well, it could be obsessive compulsive disorder. It could be attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It could be major depression or another mood disorder. And these are really the most common, but there's other things like bullying we found uh, was associated with explosive outbursts or medication side effects or medication interactions that can often cause explosive outbursts. So in order to actually correctly diagnose this symptom, and it is a symptom, it's not a diagnosis, you really have to do a fairly comprehensive evaluation. So you want to look at not only the, the medical and neurological and psychiatric aspects, but you want to look at the social, psychosocial and educational issues that may be contributing to the symptom. Is this something that they would address with their primary care physician or, did, or should they seek a specialist like a psychiatrist um, in order to receive um, a more accurate um, diagnosis of the symptoms? I think, I think for the majority of uh, patients with Tourette, starting off with their primary care provider who they should trust and, and share this kind of information is a good starting point. Now, um, the truth is, is most primary care providers do not have the range of services and expertise right. to actually identify what's going on, but they certainly should be informed about it and can uh, be a good resource for a referral. Typically, psychologists, um, psychiatrists, but also developmental pediatricians and pediatric neurologists, adult neurologists, are comfortable dealing and diagnosing, uh, diagnosing and dealing with these symptoms. So, so Dr. Bowman, what are some of the strategies to address impulse control issues and, and related um, explosive outbursts? Well, the most important point I want to get across to the audience is that there really isn't a one-size-fits-all, all right? The most important work in terms of intervention is before the outburst occurs. As the outburst is occurring, there's really very little that one can do, although I can make some recommendations to decrease stimulation, decrease you know, engagement, and what does this mean? In real terms, it means Maybe you turn off the lights, you turn off the volume on, on the radio or whatever music you're listening, you back away, you don't you know, have excessive movement. Um, one of the common types of behaviors we see is when a child's having the explosive outburst, the parent pursues them and tries to calm them down or continue agitating and arguing with them. And you have to remember that in the height of an explosive outburst, the child or adult who's experiencing the symptom is, is overactivated. Right. So you want to calm that system down. You don't want to actually add stimulation at that point. But there aren't strategies apart from you know, reducing the stimulation that you can do as it's happening. The best thing is to sort of wait patiently and quietly and in the aftermath, you know, maybe together try to work out a strategy to discuss it later. Can you talk a little bit more about how, so those, those you know, turning the lights off or reducing stimulants is, is fine for the home setting, but what happens if we're in a school setting now? So how should someone address it properly with their teacher or people around them because that might not be the case where they could turn off the lights in school? Right. So, so Megan, that's a, a great question. And again, this is where we want to emphasize the antecedents. So you want to do preventive. You know, it's, it's not so much during the outburst or afterwards where the good work is done. Generally, when I have a family come in and they describe an episode that occurred at school or more commonly at home, um, what we'll do is we'll try to problem solve in this calmer period. And 
one of the most important things that people forget to do is to ask the child or adult themselves, I know you don't like this. I know that this, uh, when you're experiencing this, you feel out of control. What do you feel might be helpful? Right. What, are your, what, what things do you feel your family, friends, teachers, classmates could do when you're beginning to feel like you will have an explosive rage? Right. And you'd be surprised how many times you'll get some very practical advice from the individual. Don't touch me. Please don't pursue me. If I walk to my room, leave me alone. Don't knock on the door. Simple things like that. But what we often will do is we'll try to teach people to recognize the symptoms. So. For example, I mean, something as common as closing your fists, right? That's a, a precursor often of feeling angry and, and feeling tense. And so teaching the individual to recognize these physical symptoms when they're beginning to feel highly anxious, highly irritable, upset, frustrated. And in, in those instances, to sort of have a plan, steer yourself somewhere where you feel that you can control yourself and calm down until you know things things don't feel so overwhelming so in the case of your question about school again I would problem solve with the teacher and the student in a, in a very neutral way okay we don't want this to happen you don't want this to happen let's come up with a plan for when you're feeling overwhelmed we can even have a cue when you may feel that you need to have a little bit of a break to sort of calm Reset. yourself right. down right. And, 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 and reconnect yourself. Great. Are there any other strategies? So are there any other strategies to implement in the school setting? Not maybe in the classroom, but um, again, remo so maybe in the uh, cafeteria, is it removing themselves or, or knowing when something's coming on to... Um... Well, I, I want to emphasize how important it is to actually look for these triggers. Right. So I said at the beginning of this discussion that often it seems as if these episodes are coming out of the blue, but in fact, there may be triggers. In, and more often than not, the triggers are associated with some type of anxiety or frustration. And so if a child, for example, in a school environment is having these episodes, is there something in the classroom? Is there someone in the classroom? Uh, or is it something even as simple as the temperature in the room okay. or the light that is contributing to you know, the, setting this child off? You really want to sort of do a very systematic analysis of the environment and all of this sort of precipitants, uh, and then you can intervene more carefully. So that's why I'm saying a one size fit all, just saying, you know, go, go to calm down you know, in a room. Right. Well, if that's a child, for example, who's being bullied every time they go to the next period of class or during the lunch room, well, then that's really not addressing the issue. Right. So you, you need to try to get a better handle on what, what's actually causing this symptom. Great. Um, Can I say something? Uh, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So another uh, common, common uh, consideration, really, is to look at what's going on at home. It's overwhelming. It's extremely upsetting for the families to uh, feel really like they're walking on eggshells all the time. And inadvertently, they end up sort of giving in or accommodating aggressive behaviors, which in the long run only reinforces that. Right. And, and much of our recent uh, research has looked at OCD, but also with Tourette, has emphasized this point. So you don't want actually to get into that uh, position where you're constantly making excuses and defending a behavior that really isn't acceptable for anybody. On the other hand, you don't want to be overly punitive and, and critical because uh, you know that harsh type of response is not a therapeutic intervention. You want something in between where, again, you're partnering in a calm moment. So I often will also look at the family and try to figure out is there a family member or parent and or parent who also has anger control problems or uh, mood disorder or ADHD or OCD because it's very common that you see these sort of you know uh, combative situations emerge when both parties actually have OCD or ADHD right. or other problems uh, controlling anger and emotions. 
So we, I know we've, we've talked a lot about um, children, but do do you see um, adults who experience explosive outbursts as well? Well, this is this is such an interesting question because early in our investigations, we thought that this was more common in children. And in fact, when you look at the adult clinical population, it, it actually is more common mm -hmm. in adults even. But many of the adults have found strategies to help themselves cope with it better. So they still experience these, these episodes or, or the you know, ac activation and agitation associated with explosive outbursts, but they're better in many cases as, as adults in finding strategies to sort of short circuit the behavior. Right. But it's certainly a cause, as you could imagine, of marital problems, relationship problems, problems you know, at, at the workplace. Right. Are there any other, um, are there some strategies to stress reduction in addition to what you've, what you've already said, finding triggers and understanding um, each case is different and understanding yourself and your child? Are there um, strategies that you can suggest to people? Um, There's multiple strategies. Yeah. So let's start with some simple things right. like sleep hygiene because sleep deprivation is really a, a very common trigger. A, an adult or child who hasn't slept well, whether or not they have Tourette syndrome, is already at more vulnerable to right. disinhibited behavior. Substance use or abuse obviously also makes you more vulnerable to disinhibition. Being hungry. One of the first things that I learned during my psychiatry training is best thing to do with agitated people is feed them. But there's some truth in that, and as I'm trying to uh, explore with a, a family or an individual what, what are the antecedents to your behavior, you'd be surprised how many times it's before meals or when a child is actually hungry and needs a snack. Right. So um, that's a consideration. You're looking at, at you know the sleep hygiene, at nutrition, and then you, you want to look at, again, just um, how does that child or adult manage their stress. What what coping skills do they have? And you know the truth is is most of us don't have great coping skills. We live in a pretty complicated world, and we don't always have time to relax or to practice our, our breathing techniques. But these can be simple breathing can actually right. reduce the uh, uh, hype, hyped up state that is so characteristic of rage attacks. So often what I will teach some of the patients I work with is just close your eyes because that's blocking the stimulation and then just focus on your breathing and just slow you know breathing uh, basic relaxation techniques actually will bring the heart rate down and that's a nice first step we've heard we've heard uh, time and time again that individuals find so you you suggest um, breathing techniques re relaxation techniques but we've seen people um, pick up sports or music or other hobbies excellent point excellent point so uh, again this is where you want to tailor it tailor your treatment or intervention individually so right. many many children and adults are not getting enough physical activity um, and particularly children with Tourette syndrome and ADHD, they absolutely need physical activity. So sometimes just intervening by providing uh, an extra break or providing some time to get out in, in, in the yard and just play basketball for 20 minutes, that alone can be so effective. Just recognizing when your child might need that additional physical activity. That's right. a really good point. Um, there was a question about uh, how common it might be for some children to actually hit themselves afterwards. And I, I think that's an interesting question because there's a lot of shame involved with this behavior. And, and I want to emphasize this, that on some instances, some instances aggression may be used to control and, and it is effective and, and it's accommodated and, and that's a bad cycle to get into. But certainly at least in in the majority of cases and, and in the early development of this symptom, there's a lot of shame involved. Right. And uh, so you really want to partner together in, a, in the most non-judgmental way you can to understand it is harder with these conditions to inhibit behavior. It's harder to face life in general. 
um, it's a problem. We're going to try to solve it together and, and try to approach it in a humanistic way. I'd like to summarize uh, some key points that I hope the audience will uh, take home with them today. One is, th is that this explosive rage or recurrent explosive outbursts, very common in Tourette syndrome, right? Very, very common. It, it's common in all different races, socioeconomic groups, ages, genders. We see it across the boards. Two, it appears to be most highly related to comorbid psychiatric or co-occurring psychiatric conditions and or autistic spectrum disorder, learning disabilities, medication side effects, and environmental stressors like bullying. Three, the best thing to do when someone is having a, an explosive outburst is to minimize stimulation, reduce stimulation. That's not the time to solve the problem. The best time to pr solve the problem is at a calm period when everyone can actually problem solve as a group. Which brings me to my next point. It's a symptom. It's, an, it's a very uncomfortable symptom, not only for the people experiencing it, but for those around them. But how you approach this symptom will really have a, a very major impact on the success of your intervention. And approaching it as a symptom that we're all trying to work on together is generally more successful than demonizing the person or punishing them harshly um, or, or being critical of this individual. Lastly, mm -hmm. we didn't address um, at length behavioral interventions. Um, we didn't address at length pharmacological interventions, but it's important as a starting point to share this information with your healthcare provider. Don't be embarrassed. It's common and you're not the only family that's suffering. And once you can share this information, then an appropriate evaluation and treatment plan can be devised. So this isn't a symptom that you have to live with for the rest of your life in silence. This is actually something that you can receive effective treatment for. Great. Well, thank you so much for, right? yes, this all is right. perfect. Thank you for sharing your expertise today with us sure. and knowledge.